Hello everyone, and welcome back to my Hard Time series in Kerbal Space Program 0.25. It is the Hard Time series because we are of course playing in hard mode in uh, career mode in KSP. And here you see the current active contracts that I have. And this is going to be a contract focused episode. We're going to try and knock some of these contracts out, some new ones that I pick up along the way, in order to increase the reputation that the agency has and thereby get even better contracts. We have a mission already en route to Duna, and so that is one reason why I'm doing all the contract missions, is because I don't want to just time warp through that mission to Duna, and uh, so I want to make use of the time appropriately, try and get some stuff done while that thing is underway. In the next episode, I'll focus on interplanetary stuff and perhaps some space planes, as you'll soon see. Uh, we'll pick up some parts that are appropriate for that. But for now, you see the contracts that we have. We have an ion engine and a separatron test in flight over Kerbin. And so those are the two things that I want to do with this test bed craft. And you see it's a very simple thing. It's got the Rockamax 2477s on the side. It's got the ion engine at the bottom and the separatrons. It is just meant to go straight up, straight back down. We'll recover it for close to full value, hopefully. And that is the goal. We've even got batteries just in case we don't want to lose electric power. You can see the radial parachutes. I thought about using a smaller tank, but I made calculations and it turned out that I needed this size. Um, I did calculate my delta V on this just to make sure. So we, uh, we do have the right amount to get to the altitudes that we need. And so here we go. Um, First thing is to get to the altitude to test the separatron, and then the ion engine is a little bit higher than that. Of course, we've got the very specific uh, window. We've got the altitude window and the speed window, so have to hit both of them, and that's the tricky part of doing these tests. I wouldn't want to do more than two at a time, I think. Uh, with these part tests that occur in Kerbin's atmosphere, I think two at a time is pretty good. So here's the separatron test, and I was just uh, focused uh, right on the velocity, uh, 360 meters per second I was looking for, so we got that done quickly and immediately after that the ion engine test was done and I don't need to be using the thrusters anymore after that, there's no reason to go any higher so landing legs out and then I try and figure out where we are going to end up. Of course it's a little bit complicated because there is the... Uh, we are technically technically uh, continuing with the momentum of the rotation of the planet, but the planet itself is also rotating. The net result is actually that the air resistance makes us go slower than the rotation of the planet, and we end up a little bit further west than we were. So um, actually we end up, well, you, you see it right there. So if I wanted to land right at the launch pad, I have to figure out how much to compensate for that in order to do so. and. Uh, drag will be part of the component of that. But anyway, here we go, our little test bed, completely successful, fairly cheap, but we're gonna even recover all that value. This is not, this series is not focused on reusability. I'm going to save that for my efficient design series. This hard time series, we're going to uh, just uh, do it by the seat of our pants, as it were. And so I'm not going to focus on designing reusable systems, except for, of course, aircraft when we get to those. So. Here we are. I was surprised that we even got any science out of that, but we did. And uh, possibly because of the contracts, but uh, also because of the... Uh, I guess we didn't recover one from flight before, so we had skipped that part. Anyway, we got the funds that we were looking for, and so I hunt for new contracts. Planet Flag on the Moon, sort of obvious. We've done it before even, so might as well do it again. Uh, and then, but the parachute one is a little bit tricky because it doesn't give much. I mean, what am I gonna do with uh, so little credits and uh, such uh, hefty fail? Well, I mean, not really hefty fail. It's just useless. So I try to get rid of it, but it pops up again anyway. And, well, it's a different one. It's a subtly different one. But anyway, I, I finally get one that I want. Testing Rockmax 2477's land at Kerbin sounds like a great deal considering that's what we just did in the previous flight. Even though it's not worth much, it does have those uh, science points associated with it, so that is good. That's a lot of science points, in fact, for testing a tiny little rocket on the surface. Okay, and otherwise, 
we get this jet engine one splashed down at Kerbin. Didn't seem very useful to me, so I got rid of it. But then we get a basic jet engine in flight over Kerbin, and that sounded a lot better. And of course, there's also the 20 science points that come with that, so I picked that one up. The Ertop Kerbin, Kerbin Rescue is something that's going to be on my mind. But first, we've got two new parts to test, so I decided to go with that first. I do have some science to spend, so I browse the the tech tree and really what I'm focused on is aircraft parts since now we're testing the jet engine in flight but I do end up missing something so you see me unlocking some aircraft parts that might be useful for the basic jet engine test of course we have to test that in flight over Kerbin Ker Kerbin yeah so we have to have something else boost us up to altitude before we test it but that's not too hard I look at the other parts, I'm thinking about my budget and wondering whether I, whether I really need them. And of course, uh, budget being both the funds and the science. I think I go for ladder here. Yeah, I mean, uh, you can't really, I mean, I really want the ladder so I don't have to EVA up to things. So, I think of this sort of thing in order to test jet engine, but then I notice that I am missing landing gear and uh, there's nothing you can do when you're missing landing gear except for unlock landing gear and I didn't want to do that just yet so I go with testing the jet engine with this little rocket test bed number two don't worry I fix up the the staging in a bit and uh, but you can see uh, we've got the rocket maxes there and so we'll be testing them on the surface while landed and uh, there you go, I actually have the staging wrong still, but I, I do figure that out before trying to launch. Come on, fix the staging. Yep. Alright, so uh, that's all fixed, so let's go. Okay, first contract filled, simple as that. Got some science out of it. But now we need to get to altitude. Of course I did the delta V calculation again to make sure that I could do that. This is heavier, right? because the jet engine is a whole ton and so we're carrying a heavier payload that's why we need the extra fuel and four Rockamax engines instead of two but there you go uh, ignited the basic jet engine once we got to the correct altitude and speed and uh, I tilted a little bit eastward in the hope that I would be able to correct my landing location but instead I ended up overcorrecting. so now I I tried my best to aim it back at the KSC, but we are going to end up in the water. No avoiding that, but uh, we're still pretty close. But I mean, it's sort of sad that uh, on a straight up vertical ascent, I can't get it back to the pad. Then again, I'm carrying only exactly the amount of fuel, or close to exactly the amount of fuel I need for the test. So if I wanted to, I could carry just a lot more fuel and then get it back to the pad. Anyway. Uh, mission is accomplished and so I go looking for even more contracts to do because we want to we want to get that sort of thing done in this episode next episode will be interplanetary stuff and perhaps some space plane stuff so I look for more contracts but it doesn't seem like there's anything great there is science data from space around Minmus actually that's worth a lot in terms of uh, funds you see 40-ish thousand there. But I also am curious about rescuing Ertop Kerman. It will be the first rescue attempt I've done in in the contract system. I haven't done one I don't yeah, I haven't done one in the efficient design series yet. But before I attempt that or even pick up that contract, I need to unlock RCS. And that's just for my own sanity. I mean technically I could just use a tiny thruster and get I get close to him that's it's not really a problem but but I don't want to take more time than necessary what I want is a system that will allow me to rescue Kerbals quickly I don't want these missions to be long drawn-out missions that uh, take half an hour or anything I want these missions to be like 10 minute missions so I pick up the mission and then design a general purpose rescuer this thing is supposed to rescue Kerbals from anywhere in low curb and orbit including at high inclinations so it's it's uh, very similar to another design I've done uh, in this series so and uh, not too much to talk about again 
uh, it is using the boosters in pairs and we empty the pod because there is a remote controller that will bring it up. The pod will be used exclusively for Airtop Kerman who is uh, thankfully in an equatorial orbit though we'll, uh, we'll time warp a bit to get him in a better position so that we can rendezvous with him. In fact uh, I end up overdoing time warp because he just sort of slides in there and so uh, he's actually a little bit further along than I would have liked but so but uh, that just means we're going to have to do an orbit or two before meeting up with him no big deal you'll notice that I do have the LVT 45 lighting at the same time that's for control as you saw in previous episodes so um, just uh, having it lightly throttled there first two boosters go off no problem and you know what I'm getting at here because I even take the liberty of doing a roll to make sure that the boosters are pulled down by gravity properly. But for some reason decoupling them still causes an explosion. Uh, they are placed exactly the same way as the other two boosters, there's no difference. Otherwise the rocket would be tilted on the launch pad. So I don't get it, I don't get why the second pair... I, it's. Be probably because we're going at a faster speed but I don't see why that should be an issue with these things anyway uh, as expected we are a bit off when it comes to meeting up with Ertop Kerman but uh, nothing we can't fix after a little while so at Apoapsis I burn to get my periapsis to a decent amount here we go there and I see that we are getting a rendezvous after one orbit but unfortunately the periapsis is way too low so uh, well we just gonna have to go around so boosting up the periapsis a little bit higher to a safe altitude more than 70 kilometers and then we we do a few orbits not too long it's about an hour and a half uh, in orbit before we end up meeting with Airtop Kerman top or air top I don't know but there there it is we get uh, a close encounter 1.5 kilometers by just that 2.6 ish we're still on the launch stage amazingly enough and so I just uh, use that to match speeds with air top air top maybe air top sounds better I'm gonna be saying his name a lot more in this episode, so I better sort of nail down a preferred pronunciation. I sort of automatically defaulted to Airtop, but maybe Airtop is a little bit better. Anyway, so you can see here, I don't think I can do more with that stage at this point, so I just dump it, even though it's got a little bit of fuel left. And from here on out, it's just RCS. I'm carrying uh, a fuel tank, uh, 0.5 tons worth of fuel and uh, one of the little Rockamax 48 7S's but that's more for if the Kerbal that we're trying to rescue is at high inclination so I'm just uh, using RCS to aim at him this thing could probably be used for more purposes than just rescuing Kerbals it's fairly... it could be used for other crew transfers as well doesn't dock with anything though, that's the downside, but it could just uh, come up right next to him as we see 20 meters. I didn't, uh, I was just going to use this to get as close as possible before activating the Kerbal. Of course you can activate the Kerbal once they're in physics range I think, which is like 2 kilometers, but you know how I am with uh, EVAing, so no point trying my luck there. In fact, just as it is, it's gonna take me a while to get him over to the pod and uh, we'll see a little bit of that but here you go uh, even within five meters I'm sticking with the pod but at about four meters I decide to just kill velocity here and uh, and switch over to the Kerbal and bring him over and while in previous versions of KSB I've been reasonably used to doing this in any camera view in this version for some reason really it's necessary to do it in chase view so you see me here changing to chase view 
Everybody recommends Chase View for uh, doing the EVA stuff, but uh, I haven't really gotten into the habit of that until this version seems to make it very, very necessary. Don't ask me why. Maybe it's just something weird and psychological on my part, but... Anyway, here I'm getting Urtop close. And he's grabbed it, but he's a little bit off. Down, down. There we go. Alright, so Urtop is in the capsule. And I decide on a very quick descent. Uh, I see that we're passing over the continent, so I just... We've got a full tank of fuel, and I just go ahead and use it. So I just expend the fuel, slowing us down, trying to get as close to the KSC as possible, but it's really actually too late. And so we're going to miss it uh, east. And it's just uh, too far. And we're out of fuel. I try valiantly to use RCS to slow down as well, but that's just, there's no point to that. So here we go, uh, headed about uh, 100 kilometers east of the KSC. When rescuing a Kerbal in the future, I'll try and actually hit the KSC. I was just sort of in a rush. We really should have made another orbit and then returned. Could probably hit it uh, pretty close. With a full tank of fuel, we could probably have gotten it right on there. We don't have landing legs, though. That's one downside. So uh, we wouldn't be touching down quite as elegantly, though we have the parachutes. It'll be, it'll be a slow, easy touchdown, if not one with lander legs. Okay, so here we go. A parachute deployment. Very good. And checking out how slow we're going. It's very comfortable speeds as we come in for a splashdown. There it is. No sign of any parts exploding. In this version, we would definitely hear that. And so how far do we end up? Uh, about 150 kilometers looks like. Not great. But uh, anyway, we did our first rescue a Kerbal mission, and I think this particular system is pretty robust. So I'll just con uh, I think we should continue rescuing Kerbals. Now, of course, I'm uh, I'm not curious to see that Airtop is part of our astronaut corps. So after I check uh, everything being good, and I note that uh, he should be available for missions, and there he is. So we have Ertop Kerman, and I decide to use him immediately, in fact. Uh, actually, looking at the screen, I decided to just, just get Kerbals by rescuing them. So there's not going to be any hiring of Kerbals. We are only going to have Kerbals by rescuing them, so all our Kerbals in this program are going to be rescued Kerbals or the main three. I take a look at the contracts and I notice the interesting combination of mainsail, skipper, and poodle, but I don't have 2.5 meter parts so I don't pick up those contracts just yet. Uh, I don't have the fuel tanks to use them properly, otherwise it'd be a breeze to try and test them. Anyway, so uh, back with this. This is a familiar uh, Mooner lander that we've used already. I just add an antenna to it, which is something we were missing the previous time so that we can transmit information back and otherwise uh, it is simply a matter of picking which Kerbal to send and like I said it is Urtop. After all we rescued him why not uh, make him do a mission for us and so out to the launch pad. Now unfortunately I decide to launch in the dark but uh, since it is a rocket that we've launched before I didn't think too much about that uh, our goal is to do some science around Kerbin, transmit or recover that, head on to the moon, and land on the moon, plant a flag, and then transfer to Minmus and get some science from Minmus. Uh, we don't have to land on Minmus, that's not necessary, and I don't I wasn't planning on on that. So here we go. Uh, booster separation imminent. Nowadays, I'm always curious whether the boosters are going to create a huge explosion when they separate. So, just watching out for that. Nope. All nice and cozy. 
Ertop looks reasonably copacetic, which is good because, you know, that he could have been suffering from some trauma and uh, it could have been psychological concerns about him, but uh, it looks like he's okay. Right here, I'm actually aiming to get my apoapsis aimed right where the transfer to the moon will, uh, will sort of uh, continue outward. Uh, you'll see what I mean. Uh, basically, what you want is to touch the moon's orbit about 45 degrees away from where the moon is right now. And so I'm trying to get my apoapsis close to where that is. So uh, once I zoom out, you'll see what I mean. So zooming out, you'll see about 45 degrees, maybe about 50 with respect to where the moon is right now. I do the orbital science around Kerbin. We've already transmitted this data, so we have to recover it. But that's really the only thing I could think of doing was the thermometer reading. Crew report has already been done, so couldn't be couldn't be used. Otherwise, we don't have any science on board. Okay, so here's our transfer to the moon. And so first we have to make orbit, which is just uh, at apoapsis, getting a minimal periapsis, you know, 70 kilometers. And then at periapsis, I got to boost for the moon. And that's what I'm doing here. So pretty much optimal. Actually, looking at it, I don't think this is quite at periapsis. It must be a little bit further on. But uh, that launch stage was expended, and we separate, and this is actually a transfer stage. It's just that we've been doing stuff reasonably efficiently, so the transfer stage doesn't have to do as much work. Okay, fine-tuning the orbit. I'm not entirely sure why I ended up uh, going for an uh, orbit that was higher than 50 kilometers, but uh, no problem in this case, as we'll soon see. And here's a scenic approach to the moon. Increasingly, I'm comfortable with uh, crossing the sphere of influence boundaries while recording with Fraps. There was a time when that actually caused a glitch and uh, either froze the game or collapsed Fraps, but now it doesn't happen, so. I can record it, at, but of course, time warping through the sphere of influence change does change your orbit a little bit, but it's not too much, and certainly wasn't a big deal here since I did have the high periapsis. Okay, making orbit here, and uh, like I said, uh, no big deal. I get my periapsis pretty close, 17 kilometers, even though the apoapsis is high. Uh, this is actually pretty good because, well, uh, you'll see in a moment, uh, we're going to be bringing our orbit down from the periapsis and hitting that crater that's sort of right in front of us. So I get the maneuver there, begin the initial descent burn, and now when we zoom out, you'll see right there. Nice, nice approach. Very nice approach. In fact, I was able to take a little cinematic skimming of the surface of the moon as we made our way there. Remember, the periapsis was only 17 kilometers, and then the uh, once I made the descent burn, uh, we were ending up about three kilometers above the surface of the crater. So that's the altitude range we're talking about here. And here is the main retro burn. And this we had to do pretty quickly because we're pretty close to the surface now. And so everything happens a lot quicker than if you're approaching from a higher altitude. That's the trick of it. So if you're going to do this sort of surface skimming approach to your landing location, you have to expect that things are going to happen a little bit faster. Here we are getting ready to ditch the the transfer stage actually, which is uh, what we've used to slow us down the whole time. Your top is uh, excited. Once the velocity is killed, we can release that tank. Though I again had some staging problems. There we go. Okay, gear down. 
And as we land, I see the sort of what I called the wood wood grain texture, but uh, we might as well call a streaky texture because it's not quite wooden. But uh, a streaky texture of some sort with these lines. I'm not too sure if that's a feature on the actual moon, Earth's moon. Uh, maybe it is. I should uh, take a look at some of the photographs. There's a lot of photographs of the moon, actually. And maybe that texture is somewhere among them. But I, I don't like it anyway. <laughs> it just doesn't look right. But here we are. Touchdown. Very nice and soft. Or top showing that despite uh, somehow being being wayward in orbit he he is a pro so uh, EV report good and since that was an EV report above the surface I decided to stow it because it's going to be different than the EV report on the surface or top manages not to face plant as he descends to the surface again a, a good sign for the future and surface sample, I pay some attention to the fact that this is basaltic rocks and breccia. I wonder if that has anything to do with the quality of the surface. But otherwise, Northwest Crater, job done, plant a flag. And it looks like even before we uh, get some text on the flag, or on the plaque on the flag, we have fulfilled our mission. So, Northwest Crater, I actually forget poor Ertop's name briefly here, so normally I'd put Ertop at Northwest Crater and then the name uh, and then the date, but just briefly forgot his name. Here we have uh, Ertop wondering why he uh, gets paid or why the agency gets paid to plant flags, and that's a pretty good question from Ertop. Uh, especially since I think we're probably going to get paid more to plant this flag than we did to rescue him. You'd think that the rescue was probably more important. Okay, anyway, back in the capsule. There we go. Now, on to Minmus. Right, because we have to do some science. Any science around Minmus will do. So, Ertop, uh, let's get going. Okay, good ascent, gear up, pretty easy to clear everything. And now the key here is that I decided not to make orbit. So short of orbit, I decided it would be possible to plot a transfer to Minmus. So you see only a partial thing there, very well controlled. I mean it's pretty close to orbit, it's not a, it, it just a little bit more burning would have done it. But then I plot for Minmus, and you see how I do that here. I don't know, I rarely actually show how I plot things, but this this particular path ended up being interesting for a number of reasons. So here, I note that we're getting close, but there's a sort of skipping going on across that gap, and that's mostly because of our inclination. And so a little bit of a different camera angle, perhaps we'll get a better view of things. You can see the gap there. So I just want to line up those markers as close as possible like so and then at the ascending node correct that inclination. And so all I need to do is bring it down and then we will get our our encounter with Minmus. And that's a good one. So here is the burn to that orbit. And then following this we also have the mid-course plane change. But this was a good deal altogether for the transfer to Minmus. And in fact, as time goes on, I think we'll get better and better transfers between Moon and Minmus. So we might have to do some more missions like that because the transfer will probably be even better later on. So this is the mid-course plane change you see here. And what happens here is sort of interesting. As we go to the map view, you will notice that uh, we're, we're actually further than I thought we would be after this burn, so I try to correct it. But as I try to correct it, uh, the game sort of prioritizes the moon over Minmus. 
and so it sort of disappears our Minmus encounter and shows an interesting moon encounter that brings us into a very tight orbit around Kerbin, entirely within Kerbin's orbit. And I decide that that might be a good thing. I don't intend to land on Minmus this time, uh, even though we have the fuel for it. I just didn't have the time left in the day to try for a landing and do all that stuff. So I grabbed the crew. I, I will eventually grab the crew report. Of course, we've already done a crew report. And so what I have to do is EVA Ertop, have him grab the stuff from the capsule, take the data, and then get back in. And now do the crew report and transmit that data because we get 100% anyway. And so after getting that crew report, we'll actually try and use the moon's gravity in order to get us uh, closer to Kerbin. And this is just a curiosity thing on my part. We've got plenty of fuel to, uh, if we wanted to get into orbit around Mimis and then do a transfer to Kerbin otherwise. But I'm just interested to see how this works out. So we pass by Minmus at high altitude, about uh, 700 kilometers uh, was our periapsis in the end. So we depart, we proceed to our moon encounter. And you can see it leaves us with a high inclination and that's not good because I still want to land close to the KSC. So I correct that inclination. Here's the correction burn. And also, at the same time, get closer to Kerbin on the periapsis side. There we go. Very nice and elegant there. So, swinging by the moon, I also do a slight burn at periapsis to get my Kerbin periapsis to where I want it to be. I initially decide on about 35 kilometers, but uh, on a mid-course adjustment I get it to 35 uh, 34.5 don't ask me why I picked that it's just uh, me trying things out so off we go away from the moon and here is our approach to Kerbin periapsis Ertop is perfectly cool with all of this and that's good because it's going to be quite an approach in the end. So here we go uh, hitting the atmosphere. 34.5 kilometers was our indicated periapsis but because uh, there is drag we end up a little bit lower than that. That's normal. And so the question is what apoapsis do we end up with after this this arrow breaking and it ends up being pretty good it ends up being about 200 kilometers so 34.5 is pretty much what I want when uh, returning from Minmus oh no sorry not Minmus the moon we were actually in the moon's vicinity okay and for some reason uh, this episode was the episode of the of the severe retro burn and sharp high G descent because that's what I'm going for here again instead of just uh, giving him a nice casual descent I choose at the I forget what it was ascending or descending node one of the nodes to correct inclination we had a slight inclination that was off and also to retro burn and that led to this image as we uh, pass close to the KSC at extreme velocities looking quite like a meter right and I immediately sent the parachutes out because we were already passing overhead of the target but we ended up uh, overshooting just a little bit had uh, had fuel but uh, I didn't want to mess up the parachutes because uh, once you start uh, throttling the engine you might end up going up a little bit in fact probably and, and at that point your parachutes would just uh, pop off so yep anyway got the science got the parts back pretty close to the KSC of course got Ertop Kerman back and fulfilled the contracts 
And so I decided to celebrate by going over to the tech tree and purchasing some more technology. First of all, airplane parts. Like I said, thinking about aircraft in the next episode. Just the beginning of uh, trying out these new parts. Nothing too fancy on that just yet. I'm probably going to be more focused on the Duna mission. Of course we needed the gear bay and so I picked that up as well as the micro struts just in case I wanted some cute little probes to send to say Jewel, Eve, Gilly, that sort of thing. So picking up all of the essential uh, aircraft parts within budget. I wanted to keep about 400,000 uh, funds so that was sort of what I was going for. So I'm uh, taking a look at the parts, trying to decide which ones I want to use first without uh, breaking my budget. So being careful about that. Still not really picking up the 2.5 meter tanks. I decide to forego that for now. Just looking at them, pining for them if you will. But right now we've got other things to do. So I did end up getting the barometer even though I that's the least useful scientific instrument. I suppose there will be something to do with it uh, down the road. But anyway, uh, with this unlocking of technology, I, uh, I think I'll call it an episode. So thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did enjoy this video, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.